Coach and Pay asked me to come and talk to you guys today briefly about clustering. And I could probably ramble on for several hours about this. So as I was reflecting on what was most important from my perspective, I thought of three things. First, data. Okay? Ever heard that uh, computer, I guess it's a computer science acronym, G-I-G-O? Garbage in, garbage out. If you start with bad code, you get bad outcomes. In the context of clustering, it simply means if you start with bad data, you get bad information. You're wasting your time. Okay, so that's the first thing I want to talk about. The second thing has to do with the algorithm selection process. And it's not so much choosing of algorithms, but more importantly, deciding on the parameter combination for each given algorithm that you choose, because that's very difficult. Okay? And it's probably as much art as science, in fact. Okay? So that's the second thing. Third thing would be evaluation techniques. You may not like this, but one of the goals in clustering is to find a good model, one that adequately or sufficiently explains the data. It's not to find the optimal model. There's a simple reason, because it's not enough time. I'll give you an example. If you were to use k-mean, it has two user-specified parameters in it, number of clusters and initial seed. Okay, now for a given task, you might have some intuition about what a reasonable range for clusters is. Like maybe if, you know, like in my case, I'm clustering the customer base, so I'm thinking there's got to be at least three clusters, right? Good, bad, average. But there probably wouldn't be any more than about 10 or 12, because at some point you reach a stage where any two adjacent clusters aren't going to be significantly different. Okay? In other words, you aren't going to treat them any differently. So there's certainly going to be a limit there. Now, on the other hand, initial seed, <laughs> this is kind of an elusive parameter because, uh, and by the way, it's also very important. It's going to decide your outcome to a great extent. Why? Because it influences the initialization of the centroids in the first iteration of the algorithm. So it decides how. So okay. Yeah. So, so clusters are simply groups of objects. Okay. And the idea in clustering is to find a set of clusters whereby the objects or records within a given cluster are similar to every other object or record within that cluster, but different from the objects or records in every other cluster. Okay? So that's, that's the goal with that. Um, and again, we're not going to find an optimal model because we don't have the time to do it. Okay, and I'll get to that in a second. But I want to go back. So initial seed okay, decides how these centroids or representative values for each cluster are deployed in the data on the first iteration of the algorithm. And so to a great extent, it's going to determine what the outcomes are, good or bad. OK. 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 Well, I'm good. I'm just introducing. No, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to introduce the topic, and then I'll go deeper. OK. So that, this is the, the, the second thing that I want to talk about is algorithm selection, but more importantly, determining the combination of parameters that you ultimately want to use. My point here is it's tough. Okay, it's tough to do. Okay, the third thing I want to talk about is evaluation techniques. All right, so given that you're going to build all of these clustering models, you need a way to judge them in relative terms. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a few of those things that you can do relative to evaluating these models with the intention of finding the best model given the ones that you ultimately explore. 
okay? Because you can't look at them all. You can't do a brute force analysis of these things. You don't have enough time. Okay, so back to the first topic, data. Okay, so it's not the case that we can just take a raw data set that's out there in space and throw an algorithm on it and expect to get anything of value at the end of the day. Okay, and there are a multitude of reasons for that. For one thing, um, we don't want any attributes that are irrelevant. Okay, attributes that don't contribute to what we're trying to find out because they will simply cloud the analysis. Okay, so we need to get rid of that stuff. All we want are the relevant dimensions or attributes. More importantly, once we've discovered these relevant set of attributes, we need to ensure that we don't have attributes that are highly correlated with one another. Okay, so let's say, you know, we take a data set for which we're going to answer some business question through clusters. Okay, we do some research, we discover what we feel to be the relevant set of attributes, at least in a preliminary sense. Okay, and let's say we come up with four or five of these. But then we find out that two of them are very highly correlated, like let's say 0.95 or something like that, which means what? They essentially vary and they move in the same direction. So in other words, they're explaining the same phenomenon, essentially. We don't need them both, okay? The challenge there would be finding the best of the two and simply eliminating the other one. Okay, so that's one thing, a very important consideration relative to the data. But that's not enough, okay? We can't just take the raw data then with the relevant attributes and cluster that. And one very dramatic reason for this is because uh, quite often, most often, dimensions are not going to be standardized within the subset of data that we're analyzing. So I'll give you an example here. What if, for a particular analysis, we decided that age and income were important? Okay, and we're dealing with an adult working population. So we'd say probably a relevant range for age would be somewhere between about 20 and 70, roughly, okay, in years. And income in annual US dollar terms would probably be somewhere between 20,000 and, who knows, a couple million. That's, that's me at the other end. Okay, so generally speaking then, we could say that probably income would be expected to be roughly a thousand times greater than age. Okay, so a person who's 20 years old might be making $20,000 a year. So the income dimension is much larger, and because of that, it's going to dominate the analysis. So basically, age isn't even going to be a factor, because you might as well not even use it for that purpose, okay? Because income is going to drive the analysis, because it's larger. So we need a way to standardize our dimension. In other words, represent them on the same scale. Um, and doing this is not necessarily a simple process either, because there's a preliminary consideration we have to make. Um, and it can go a bit deeper than this, but I'm going to give you the, the general overview. You need to determine whether or not you're dealing with a qualitative or a quantitative attribute in each case. Okay? Big distinction here is quantitative attributes demonstrate the properties of addition and subtraction at a minimum. Which means this. If we take any dimension value and we add one to it, okay, that unit increase means the same thing as if you take a one unit increase on any other dimension or on any other value for that dimension. Okay? So if I have a dimension and I look at two values, one is 100, another is 20, and I add one to each of those, if the incremental increase is the same for both of those, then that demonstrates the property of addition. Subtraction is the same thing, only the opposite direction. Okay? So you might initially think any number is a quantitative attribute, and that's not true, okay, necessarily. Let me give you an example of one that I found doing some research. Um, one particular data set that I have has an attribute that's called behavior score. Now, it's kind of pseudo-analogous to the concept of the U.S. credit score, okay? where we have particular numbers, and that number um, is associated with a certain level of risk, okay? But a given range of values corresponds to a certain risk level. So it might be the case that between 100 and 199, we have high risk. 
between 200 and 299, you have medium risk, so on. So, with that paradigm, if I was to add 1 to a value of 100, I would get 101. I'm still at high risk, right? Because the high risk category was 100 to 199. What if I was to add 1 to 199? I would move from a category of high risk to medium risk. So clearly, we don't have the property of addition being demonstrated there. That's really a qualitative attribute. And it's got to be standardized in a different fashion relative to quantitative attributes. All right? Um, should I explain what procedure for doing that or not? For normalization? Well, I mean, I can do it. OK. So basically, we do that. Okay, after we've decided on the relevant dimension, we've determined the data type, whether we're dealing with quantitative or qualitative for each one. Now we can do what's referred to as normalization. Okay, and one method for doing this for quantitative attributes, not qualitative, is that we take the actual value and subtract the minimum value in the numerator and the denominator, we take the maximum value and we subtract the minimum value. And what do I mean by minimum and maximum? This is done for each dimension. Okay? So for each value within a given dimension, A is the actual value we want to normalize. The minimum is the minimum value in the range for that dimension. Okay? And maximum is the maximum value. So if you look at this long enough, you'll see that if the actual value we normalize is also the maximum value, what's this become? Right? The largest normalized value can be. If, on the other hand, the actual value is the minimum value, what does this become? Zero. And anywhere between the min and max is somewhere between zero and one. So we've normalized it on a zero, one scale, which is what's quite often done in clusters. Um, sometimes algorithms simply work better for that kind of normalization. But the point is, if we were to normalize age and income using this formula, we'd have them both on a 0, 1 scale. Now, we wouldn't expect either one of those attributes to dominate our analysis. Okay? Now, incidentally, what if we wanted one to be weighted more heavily than another? Like, let's say we wanted income to be twice as important as age, what would you do? Right, you could just multiply income by two, the normalized income by two, and you'd have that. So you could weight the attributes after normalization if you want to do that, okay? Depends on, you know, your problem. And the research that you've done to find out what dimensions are relevant and the extent to which they're relevant. So it's a process. It's not an easy one necessarily. The data usually tells a lot about what you need to do. Okay? It's extremely important to consider in terms of pre-process to get ready for questions. Okay. Um, qualitative attributes on the other hand. Um, so what if I had a data set, I don't know what I'm using it for necessarily, but maybe just some personal project. Um, of marathon participants over the past five years, and one of the dimensions I thought was important was the place that they finished. First, second, third, and so on. Okay. So the first question I have, would that be a qualitative or a quantitative attribute? And you know that because I'm in that discussion, right? But can you explain why? That's true, but also, would you expect that um, the difference between first and second place is the same as the difference between 498th and 499th? No. That's another way you could say it. Because it's not always the case that when you have numbers, they're quantitative. That's the only reason I say that. Quite often, they will be, but not all the time. So you've got to be careful there. Okay. so. There are a few ways we can look at the, the qualitative attributes. Clearly, finish in a race is referred to as an ordinal attribute, okay? Because we can make some relative judgments about it. We can say, well, 
first place is strictly superior to every other place. The tenth place is better than everything except first and ninth, so we have an ordinal situation here. Um, we could normalize it quite simply by determining the number of possible places there were and having a simple descriptor for each one, like one, two, three, four, and so on, A, B, C, D, and so on. Another thing we could do if we didn't have too many of these, like let's say they only track the top 10 finishers or whatever, so we had 10 categories relative to that attribute. We could use what's referred to as asymmetric binary normalization. Okay, that's maybe going on a little bit beyond the scope of this discussion, but it basically entails describing each of those attributes with a string of zeros and ones. And then the length of that string is going to be equal to the number of categories you're trying to normalize. So in this case where we have top 10 finishes being tracked, we only need 10. So the length of that binary string will be 10. So maybe first place is 1 followed by 9 zeros. Second place is 0, 1 followed by 8 zeros. And so on. And when you get done, each string is unique. So you can handle it that way as well. If it's a simple uh, qualitative attribute like true false, male, female, yes, no, then you can use basic binary uh, normalization, just zero and one. So maybe female is one, male is zero. True is one, false is zero, etc. Okay. So at this point, any questions? Because our data is normalized now. And I can move on, unless you want to talk about this a little bit more. All right, so data, very important, okay? Garbage in, garbage out. So if you don't have good data, um, don't start <laughs> until you do. Um, second thing is algorithm selection. More importantly, parameter selection, or finding a method by which you can construct a meaningful set of parameters in terms of model outcomes. Okay, so I want to get back to um, this example that I kind of introduced. Um, I both didn't like it. <laughs> um, but every algorithm has a set of user-defined parameters, okay? And typically two of them. So if we talk about k-means, the user-defined parameters are number of clusters and initial seed. If we talk about DB scan, the user defined parameters are minimum number of points to constitute a cluster, as well as epsilon, which has to do with. In fact, um, we could, uh, you know, you could have, you know, you could take your data set and just stick it in one cluster, right? Or two, or three, or. And. I mean, I don't know, uh, like, so take k-means, for example, it's a, it's a user-defined parameter. So you tell the system, or the algorithm, how many clusters you want to come up with at the end. Okay, and you're only limited by the program that you're using if it has a maximum limit on number of clusters. Okay, and I'm not sure what that value is in Weka. Um, I need to find out, but no, no. Any, any, any task where you can envision that the grouping of objects has value to you. So maybe you're sitting around at home and uh, you know you got your movie collection over in the corner and you think, you know what, I'd like to cluster that. So you build a data set. You decide what the relevant attributes are of all your movies, construct your data set, and you do cluster. <laughs> so, I mean, you can use it for anything where grouping of objects has value. Yeah, clustering actually takes the data and does something with it. It clusters it, groups it, based on the data that it has to analyze. It's looking for patterns in that data. Well, specifying the number of clusters depends on what algorithm you use. Okay, so if you use k-means, yeah, you have to specify how many clusters you want for any given execution of the algorithm. You're not just going to run it once. You're going to run this press hundreds of times parameter combinations, because you're trying to narrow this process down to the point where you come up with a good model, and you judge that based on evaluation criteria, and it's all relative to other models that you've built, okay? 
Um, now, if you're using an algorithm like dbscan, you don't specify the number of clusters. The algorithm determines that automatically based on the other parameters based on, and the data. Okay. So, this isn't all entirely purely scientific. The parameter selection process, and, and I'll talk about it in a minute, it, it's kind of an art in many cases. As far as I see it, now, Nicholas might disagree with me, but I don't see um, a real purely scientific way to um, find that good model. You need a strategy in most cases. Okay, so let's get back to parameter selection. I want, it, I want to illustrate the scope of the problem here. Take k-means, okay? And my case, right now, what I'm trying to do is cluster a customer base. So I have some a priori notions about what the number of clusters would be in a range. 3 to 12 is what I've decided. Okay, and I think that's pretty reasonable. So that one I can explore through brute force techniques, not a problem. But initial seed, I can't. Okay, I don't have any in advance assumptions about what that initial seed should be. Okay, because in truth, <laughs> what it does is it specifies how the random number generator instantiates the centroids in the data set on the first iteration of the algorithm. So the centroids are, if you specify the number of clusters, that's five. You're going to have five centroids in your data set when the algorithm executes. And those things are going to be deployed on the initial iteration of the algorithm in a certain way. Okay? But how they're deployed is very important. And it's decided by initial seed. Okay? Wait. Okay, so whether or not those centroids converge ultimately after several iterations of the algorithm on the natural clusters existing in the data is largely contingent on the initial seed. So you've got to explore many of these if you're using k-means. It's not sufficient to just specify one set of parameter combinations and say, there's my model. Um, you might get lucky, but uh, you probably won't. Okay, furthermore, in Weka alone, you can specify as initial seed any non-negative integer value between 0 and 999,999,999. 999 so you got 1 billion possible initial seed values. Okay? So if I explored all 10 possible number of clusters in conjunction with all 1 billion possible initial seeds, I did kind of a back of the envelope computation. And I think it would take like 7 million hours or something to run all of those, to get all of the results, if it took you about a minute to build each model. OK? You won't be alive long enough to do it. So you, that's why you can't. That's why you can't find the optimal model, right? What you want to find is a good model. And you do that through relative evaluation of the models that you have, the forces that you built. Okay? Um, but there can be a strategy that you can employ. So let me kind of describe this briefly. So let's take the k-means algorithm. In many cases, you'll have an a priori notion about what a likely range of number of clusters will be. Okay? So you can start with that. Then as far as initial seed, you need some kind of way to converge on at least an acceptable set of initial seeds. So one thing that I tried was I looked at initial seeds starting at zero in increments of 10, extending out to 100. Okay, So I paired initial seed of zero with number of clusters 3 through 12. Then I looked at initial seed of 10, number of clusters 3 through 12, and so forth. And then at the initial seed of 100, if I, if I noticed that error was fairly low, I extended my analysis out even further. In fact, I ended up going from 0 to 120 in increments of 10. Okay? Then I graphed the results in terms of training error, because I was interested in the data set itself and the error that it exhibited. And I looked for points of low error, okay? And then what I did 
is I isolated those regions and I looked at every possible initial seed value, five units in either direction. Okay, so I noticed low error at initial seed of 10 and 80, I believe, okay? So what I then did is I built additional models where I looked at initial seeds from five to 15 in increments of one, and also from 75 to 85 in increments of one, and paired those initial seeds with all of my possible number of clusters. When I was done, I ended up building about 400 models, okay? Then I looked at all these models, and I tried to decide what my top five initial seeds were based on that analysis, and then I graphed the results. So for each initial seed, I had something like this. Okay, so let's say this was my initial seed of 25. Then I've got error on the y-axis and I've got number of clusters on the x-axis. Three, four, five. Six, seven, actually went out a little further than that, went out 12. Okay, and then error is here. Doesn't really matter what it was, the point is, as my number of clusters increased, the error declined, which is not a surprising result. Okay, so let's say here I had that much error. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's just say that I ended up with something like this. for an initial seed of 25. Now, first of all, notice that as the number of clusters increases, error declines, okay? That's not really surprising, because here's what I'm gonna propose to you. I could get to zero error in a cluster. Okay, every time. Every time I could do it. Pretty amazing, isn't it? But you know all I need to do to achieve that? is know the number of records in my data set and have the same number of clusters as the number of records in my data set, right? So if I've got 10,000 records in my data set and I build a model with 10,000 clusters, then surprisingly it has zero error. Why? <laughs> because each point, each record is a separate cluster, but does it tell me anything? I'm no further ahead then than when I started. I haven't done anything, okay? So we need to do more than just minimize error in building a good model. We need to take it in light of the number of clusters we have and whether or not we see diminishing returns in terms of error reduction as we move from n to n plus one cluster along. So if you were looking at this, where do you see it? Can you tell? where the slope changes to become less positive? No. Okay, so it's right here. Right, you see it? They call this elbow or knee. Okay, and so not surprisingly, it's sometimes referred to as elbow analysis. Okay, but it is a method that you can use, believe it or not, to try to help you decide what for a given initial seed and set of clusters is a likely uh, best solution. Now, you might see multiple knees or elbows in a given graph like this, okay? And so you would consider all of them, at least preliminarily. Okay, so that's one thing you can do. But it's not enough uh, in and of itself because we don't really know that that is indeed the best model for an initial seed of 25, okay? We need some method to help us give some support to that view, okay? So you need a supplemental technique in conjunction with this, okay? And now we officially transferred over to the evaluation stage here. This was actually part of it, okay? It's kind of streamlined with the running of the algorithms and, and evaluation of the model. So, what can we do? There are basically two things that tell us whether a clustering is good or bad. Cohesion and separation. 
okay, what's cohesion? Cohesion has to do with the compactness of a cluster. Okay, so it's an intra-cluster attribute. The more compact a cluster, the smaller the cohesion is, the better it is. Okay, because cohesion is a distance measure. So the smaller that distance, the better cohesion is. Separation, on the other hand, is an inter-cluster attribute. And it tells us about the separation between clusters. Okay, and we want that to be bigger. Okay, so we want cohesion to be small, we want separation to be large. And there are many measures that we can use to assess this. But there's one that I prefer. It's called the silhouette coefficient. And the reason I like it so much, because it assesses both simultaneously. A lot of these measures do one or the other, but not both. Okay. Try to do this in layman's terms, okay? The theoretical formula for it is a little bit. How much time do I have? The theoretical formula is a little bit confusing um, because silhouette coefficient can theoretically vary between minus one and one, okay? But a negative silhouette coefficient in the context of clustering makes no sense at all because what it tells you is that cohesion is larger than separation. And you've got very dysfunctional results if that happens. That should not happen, OK? So you realistically should have a, a, a silhouette coefficient somewhere between 0 and 1 inclusive. Closer to 1, the better, OK? So in that context, the silhouette coefficient looks like this. A sub i is the average cohesion value. B sub i is the average separation value. We want A sub i to be as small as possible, B sub i to be as large as possible. So when A sub i is 0, what's the silhouette coefficient? Right? When um, these are both the same, the silhouette coefficient is okay. So let me explain this to you just very rudimentary. Okay. These are two cluster centroids. Okay? I have a two cluster model with these as my centroids. And I only have one other point. Okay, so it's a it's a data set with three records in it. Two clusters, two centroids, one point, and it's in this cluster. Okay, and the distance between that point and this centroid, which I'll call 1, is 0.5. And the distance, I know the scale is wrong, but the distance between that point and this centroid is 1. Okay? This is cohesion, okay, because it relates to this point, which is a member of that cluster. This is separation, because it's this point as it relates to the adjacent cluster. So in this formula, what's my silhouette coefficient? This is A sub i. This is B sub i. 0.5. Turns out that 0.5 and above is a good is a good clustering. Okay? Um, now on the other hand, what if this point was right here on my centroid? Now what's the silhouette? One. How likely is this in practice? Very unlikely. Especially when you're talking about huge data sets, say 100,000 records or whatever. In order to achieve a silhouette coefficient of one, basically every point's got to be on the centroid in every cluster, and it's not going to happen. Okay? So in reality, silhouette coefficients of 0.5 to 0.6 are really good. Okay. So expand on this and know that this computation that I did here, where I took that point, measured that distance and that distance, 
is done for each and every point in a given model that you create. Then the average cohesion is, is calculated, that becomes A sub I, and the average separation is calculated, and that becomes B sub I. So it's a pretty extensive computation. And fortunately, uh, uh, programs can do this for you. Well, that's nice. Okay. But this is what we can use as a complementary mechanism to determine, in fact, what the best number of clusters is for a given initial seed value in k-means. So go back to that graph that I had up here before, where I looked at that elbow at five clusters. And we kind of started to say that maybe five clusters is the best model for an initial seed of 25. Well, what if we graph the silhouette coefficient in the same manner? So three, four, five, six, seven. This is number of clusters. And this is the silhouette coefficient out here. And let's say we end up with something like this. And this is, I don't know, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.4. So now what would you say? Remember, bigger silhouette coefficient is better. Right? So this gives us support for the observation that we made in the previous stage. Okay? Um, so this is kind of what I've done through my research where I tried to identify the top five seeds. Once I did that, I identified, I think, nine models that were potential candidates for construction because four of my initial seeds actually had two numbers of clusters that looked like they could be most appropriate based on elbow analysis. And then I construct a silhouette coefficient to try to confirm indeed what the best solution was. Okay, so these are the kinds of mechanisms that you could use to op ultimately arrive at a good clustering for your data. But again, I want to emphasize that you're not going to find an optimal model. If you do, it's going to be purely by chance, and you're not going to really know it's an optimal model because you will not have run every other possible model that's out there. Right? So you want something good. So happy clustering. Okay. Why would you look use class? You are already going into the technicalities of Paul. Uh, good, but uh, tell me the generic business problem that you would use. Like Group date. Very good. And why do you want to group date? David. We are trying to understand the data, tell a story about the data. Good. I saw another hand up. Simplify the story the data is doing. Good. Okay, good. And that's exactly what I'm going to try to show you here. I'm going to try to, to show you something we did with, uh, with an insurance company, um, trying, to, trying to organize uh, their information. So let me see if I can save this into my drive and transfer it, because I don't have the right devices. Okay, so the purpose here was we got about 275,000 wire transfers out of an insurance company. And uh, these wire transfers uh, uh, were from a multitude, uh, from a multitude of sources. So they, this insurance company had maybe 2,000 feeder systems. And they paid when someone died or when there was something to be paid. But you couldn't really work very definitely on the source data because they came from different systems. So each one had different characteristics. So actually what they gave us is a big pool of data and say, have a look at it. So the only thing we could really do is fish around with it. So we, we did that with basically a cluster. Now, putting some of the things that, uh, that Paul said here together is we actually 
used a software, Weka, that's the name of a software, it's a free software. Also, there is a paid software called SAS, which most people use these days. There is also a software which is free called R. And R is actually a collection of software for many, many universities and libraries that you, that you can use in your lab. And you, you don't put the entire R in because they, it's infinite in size, very large in size. So you bring in what you need. And it's good because it's free. Free is good, correct? It's not good because you're not totally sure that the software has been well verified. Turns out that this was actually Sudapa's dissertation. And turns out that she actually found what she thought was errors. Um, errors in SAS. She thought SAS was computing things wrong. So as she actually was happier with Weka, she also felt that Weka was less demanding in computer resources. She was running models that was taking her five, six, ten hours in her laptop to run. We actually moved the models to our servers and they still were very, very slow. Okay. And so she tried to run this in Weka. And what Weka does is bring the groups to the same column. And you can show it in different ways. And this is uh, actually a spectrogram, meaning breaks things into the groups. And the, if there is very blue, is most of the blues are here, etc. And this is the way it is done. We don't use very much of this. We look all of this. And what Paul was talking, trying to simplify this, was there is some kind of geometric center in each one of these groups. And you are trying to do two things in fraud detection. One type of thing you're trying to do is understand what the groups mean. The second thing you're trying to find out is what are the things that are very far from the geometric center because that has a higher loading effect on being a potential fault. And so what we actually found in here was that there was a group that was not unsubstantial that had a lot of payments of life insurance between six and nine years after the death of the individual. So substantially delayed paid on life insurance. Can you have a hypothesis what that thing was? Could be? Uh, I, I heard the Namita say. Fraud. And what kind of fraud would that be? Yeah, but explain me the event. That, that, then you would try to collect real funds, right? Before people discover. Uh, when do you delay? When is that like six to nine years? First, uh, what we thought it was was a dormant account scheme. What does that mean? Someone dies, someone from inside realizes that Tim was covered, but no one claimed it. So he claims it. Okay? But that needs collusion. Needs someone inside and someone to collect the money outside unless you want to take your chances. Okay? So that's what we thought it was. When we went to the, to the insurance company and said that's what it was, we thought this was, he said, no, 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 this is litigation. And what happens is that Namita and Osana are sisters, and they are fighting who gets the money from their father. Okay? Turns out that I kind of looked it up, asked lawyers, friends of mine, doesn't take that long, that type of litigation. And so I raised that issue, and it still didn't get anywhere. So we actually had, uh, we actually had the field, which was the account number that the thing was deposited. So we pulled these ones that were the six to nine years and listed the account numbers. And there were nine entries to the same account. And there's nine entries to the same account. Obviously, we were not going to pursue them. We gave it to the insurance company. And they wouldn't tell us if it was fraud or not. Uh, the reason they said they wouldn't tell us was that uh, they gave the list to the fraud department. They never heard again. It's private, confidential. And many companies act that way. They keep their 
Uh, you know, many companies get it throughout the day off, and uh, they keep it pretty quiet because losers confidence. Uh, you know, if a bank is being defrauded, you say, "Why well, I'm going to deposit on that? They are, they are being defrauded all the time. They're not controlling my money very well." So that that's uh, the story that seemed to be. Uh, however, what we do this requires feedback to see if our models are good. I was talking validation of models. That was uh, that's uh, the particular problem. So we couldn't work with this company. We stopped working because we are not getting the feedback. My friend. Oh, everyone, yeah, everyone. You, you don't want to have the public know that there is internal fraud. My fire employee is very often you don't even prosecute because it's a big, big stain on your management. It's a big stain on your auditors. But as I said, I think you heard me saying last time, I said auditors really don't want to catch big fraud. External auditors because they use a client. Internal auditors because why didn't they catch it a year before? Okay, and why did they let it happen? So you know this, they, for, uh, auditors like to find small problems that they don't lose the client and they show the value added. Okay, so th that's uh, the story of the insurance company. I just want to show you one more slide here. It's the same data the same data, but shown in a different ways. And these are basically oriented to find aberrations. And the aberration, look at this, all red, red, and this, these guys red here. And there's a couple of blues there that are not in this domain. Now, these are, as, <coughs> as I said, you're looking for two things. One thing, a group that is aberrant, the group itself. The other one is the distance. And this is the main thing of it. Now, how? where put the carriage in front of the horse. We was already talking that the mathematical techniques that you need in order to achieve some of these. And I think, Paul, uh, I'm going to put words in your mouth and then you correct me, okay? The first thing Paul talked about is you need to collect data. Okay, so that was important here. And then he said you need to choose a model. And then you need to have a way to evaluate if the model is good or not. And then he went into methods or what are the metrics that you use for evaluation. And he went into alternate clustering methods of doing that. And that's what he's doing on his dissertation, et cetera, et cetera. But what does what do you know, need to know if you are going to be at PwC doing this stuff? Oh, no. Some, being a PwC doing audits, you need to know that this thing exists and it could be done. And most likely PwC will have a data analytics group that should be able to do this. I don't think they are that skilled on it, so maybe you can't find the data analytics group uh, to do multidimensional clustering, but they will do something. I, I think we need, if they want to do clustering, we would need to create a little example with this is the data you have, this is your problems that you have, uh, this is how you would run it, ideally in Excel, because they guys are good in Excel, okay, on something that they, they can do. Uh, huh? Yeah, WIC is pretty easy to use. Yeah, we actually teach this stuff in our uh, in our audit analytics sequence, and supposedly maybe next year there'll be an audit analytics sequence in the PA MBA program. We are going to use the same courses. Maybe it'll be distance courses. Maybe they'll be in local, and maybe a few of you will be even allowed to take it now. I'm not sure. You have to ask Professor Sanel about that. But that, we do that, and if you, uh, you heard the little noise making there with my computer, I actually picked up a lecture on clustering that she gave, and we have it on a video, and I will give it to you. Okay, I'll put it in some place that you can click on it and, and, and look at it. Okay, I, and now we will have Professor Paul doing all this, correct? Because we just captured him on video. 
So because he's so good looking, the girls will want to look at him, not at you. It's on video too. Yes, you had a question? Yeah, well, the data, I, I did say you probably didn't hear. I said this is wire payments out of a particular insurance company outside going out. And they corresponded to claims. But the claims are out of a lot of different systems. Uh, like, for example, any life insurance, pet life, okay? They actually have whole set of insurance policies. And according to insurance law of the United States, if a particular group of policies are the system, there is still one or two people in there, they cannot cancel the insurance. And so they offer to the clients when they want to change the nature of the insurance that to move to another policy. They say it's better and gooder and whatever. And if you don't want to change, that's it. They have to keep it living. So at the end, they have a large set of feeders that who can generate claims. And some of them for years don't generate the claim. You know, Warren Buffett loves insurance companies. Why? He said, people pay me for decades before I have to pay them anything. It's very good. You keep someone else's money. Okay. He, he is, uh, well, Geico. Geico is one of the biggest insurance. He really made, grew it because that's what he says. He loves, loves insurance companies. Uh, so this was actually information. But in other systems, you know, you would probably be able to do a lot of modeling at this level, understanding the annuities, understandings. We are doing that for Saul, okay? But in this case, it was like a pig in a poke. We had no idea of what came from here. And they actually were collecting different forms. We had certain fields that were empty, half of the, uh, half of the, because that particular system wasn't wasn't actually captured. So, and so what we are trying to do is trying to understand in groups the things that we are paying. And of course, you look at this. This is great, correct? Let's suppose this thing has a very good predictive value and you, put, you can 95% of the times detect a fraudulent transaction. Correct? So why are you going to pay? You put the filters in here, and before, before you pay them, you ran your algorithms and pulled out the ones that are the most suspicious. Remember what I said about false positives and false negatives, correct? Here it is. All the transactions are coming in. You divide them in positives and negatives. And the positives, you have false positives and real positives. The negatives, you have false negatives and real negatives. And then what else did I say? As the tighter that you make your filtering, you'll have less positives, okay? And what will that mean if you have less positives? That these positives are going to be more positive. That means they'll be more exact. But you're going to be gaining a lot of false negatives. Although there is some trade-offs of improving your model and et cetera, et cetera. So, so, you are going to decide, you're going to create a loading factor. Maybe you're going to use distance from the centroid and the nature of the group. This group here would have only a 10% incidence of frauds or whatever given. And then this group here would be much larger, like the seven to nine years. So you would mix criteria to get a better loading factor. And in these things, the idea is when you call, you have what you call the label data set. What is a label data set? A data set that you know what the outcome was, was fraud or not fraud. We do, we have a data set with credit card data. Okay, and credit card data, at the end, you know what happened. Okay, either the client paid or the client didn't pay. If the client didn't pay, was it his expense or was a fraudulent expense? Was the credit card closed by the bank? credit card was closed by the client, or it's still open. Okay, so you know what happened. So it's great when you know what happened, because if you know what happened, you create a model 
and then test the model against your own data, but a different data set, what you call the holdout sample, and you have a very good predictor. Here, it was very difficult because this was all unlabeled. You didn't know. You didn't even have examples of fraud that you could use. We asked them, and they couldn't give us, or they didn't want to. Okay. But guys, tell me why is this valuable? Saves time. Uh, I don't have your name there. Uh, what, what's your name? Huh? Sophie? Yeah, can, you, can you put names in front of you? I, I maybe know half of the names now. I'm not doing very good. Okay. Uh, so, saves time. But the, the real thing is progressively these systems are totally automated in the sense you, there is very little manual intervention. There is an ERP, there are systems working on top, top of the systems. If you don't observe the data, you're not going to know these things happen until years after. So what you want to do is have a real-time system or close to real-time system to monitor. And what also you want to do is to be able to do deal manually to see the things that are potential anomalies. And the trade-off of looking at anomalies is how much it costs you to look at each anomaly and how much you're saving by looking at each anomaly. Some things are a reputational choice, the economics are much more extreme. I saw a hand here. Yeah. Well, what what we did is exceptional exceptions. Remember, we were talking about this last time. What we did is we pulled uh, the ones that we thought that they had a higher probability of being fallacious, and we basically give to the internal and say, hey, guys, go and test them. Go and look at them. And they were not particularly cooperative, but uh, Itaú is very cooperative. They just say, please don't give us too many to look. And it's to their advantage. The more we refine our models, the less problems they will have. And so the more, the more, and the reason why you're starting to use more and more this automation, because you lost what we used to call observability, your ability to, to see what's happening. And let's suppose that, let's suppose that those insurances I was describing to you were really inside of fraud. Will they ever know it was inside of fraud if you don't point them out? They'll never know. They pay, they lost money, they are indexes of uh, profitability of the system were worse, but they don't know why. They were chipped forever. Yeah. That's, yeah, well, you know, it's what we call alerting. And alerting is, remember what I said here before, there are the actuals, there are the standards. You compare your actuals against the standards. And if, that, if the difference is very more, very large, you send an alert. And the alert could go, to, could go to the auditors, could go to management, could go even to the IRS. Okay? And these alerts are done either by reports or they are done by a dashboard. Or they're mailed. Or they could be phone calls. I've seen places that, that do a, one of those robocalls and leave messages. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. You, we have a project, and it's not exactly what he's saying, but uh, it's not too far. But we have a project, uh, I mentioned it last time, with Procter & Gamble. And this project is the project of looking at the P card. And we're going to have uh, Denise or Abdullah come here to talk about this. Right? Maybe we should have a P card. The P -card you know what a P card is? It's a payment card. Uh, Procter & Gamble has something like four to six billion dollars a year in P card expenses. What it is, you need to buy something for the company instead of going to purchase it. You basically get the card and you can buy it. It's a credit card. It's a credit card, but it's a company credit card as opposed to yours. So taking your girlfriend to the movies is not good. 
in that thing. Okay, going for a beer bust with your friends is not a good expense. Buying diapers for your child is not a good expense. Yes. I don't know what G card means. The, this particular P card of Dr. Gamble is Citibank. And they have some reports, but we wrote an expert system for reporting. But the problem with this thing was the following. We wrote a system that basically pick up Lisa and emulated Lisa, we created iLisa. We extracted exception. Okay, now, we looked at those exceptions, Lisa looked at those exceptions, and then if you really thought it was an exception, it goes to human resources, the person might be fired and it doesn't happen, etc. Or they might reimburse the company in a boundary situation, you do something with that. The problem is that you don't get things labeled very well because you don't know. You, you get a big set of exceptions, you're not going to deal with each one of them. Now, so actually what we use as a labeling is Lisa's evaluation. So instead of going to legal and expecting a resolution of the case, we had this woman who was the expert to tell us this is suspicious, this is not. So we didn't found this is fraudulent. We found this is suspicion or not, and that's the way we label it. Okay? You see that uh, Abdullah in the knees did? That's what they are using for, for later. Uh, 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 just giving you a more generic thing that I think is worth for, for you to hear is, I'll come to you one second, is uh, this is called machine learning. Machine learning are methods to analyze data. And there are two categories of machine learning. One machine learning that is labeled when you know outcomes of what you have, so you can build a model that predict that outcome, and there is the non-labeled. And those are that you have to kind of figure out a way to find out that the exceptions are real exceptions. Okay? Yeah. We, do, uh, we do statistics and modeling for identifying exceptions. Ultimately, the verification is manual at this point. Well, and that's why this is such a big problem. And that's why I'm saying that these are exceptional exceptions. Why? Because you get a large, you have a 20 million transactions. You pull a one-tenth of one percent, you have 20,000 transactions. You put the 100 of 1 percent, okay, you have 10,000 transactions. So, you know, 10,000 transactions would take a year for the auditor to verify. Correct? So it's an expensive process. So what you want to find out is what we say calls exceptional exceptions. That ones are likely to be exceptional and are big enough to be worth looking at. Itau always says, nothing below 5,000 reais, $2,500 is worth it. So we cut it off. But that's bad. Why? Because Jeremy will find out they don't look at anything before, so he'll do a 4,900 many times. Right, Jeremy? You know? Okay. And so what you really, if you want a good detection program, you also need to do do the audit hand now and then to understand. When we, when we are working with this insurance company, they told us that no internal transactions should be verified on this wire. Sometimes they wire between their organization. And I didn't like that at all, so we looked at those too. Because I thought that, uh, and we did find some anomalies, but they are not interesting. We did call them. Yeah. They get, they, no, no, no. Internal money wires was a post parameter. They gave us 275,000 wires in a certain period of time. And when we pulled them out and called their exception, because some were very aberrant, they said, oh, don't worry about these because they're internal. For example, they had no approvals, no internal approval. Okay, I just wired without someone authorizing. So control issue. Every time we do these studies, there is a whole set of control notes. What is a control note? It is basically a prover was not there, or a prover uh, is below the rank of the originator, or there were 
10, 20, 30 kind of these little rules that we look at to see the rules were obeyed. And you always find, you know, people say these automated systems, these things never happen. When we go to a company and say, let's have a look at your payables, your payments for duplicate payments, they always say we don't have duplicate payments because SAP or Oracle verifies them. And we always find duplicate payments. The question is a few or many. Remember, I'm talking about these papers here. So th this is basically, uh, uh, basically a little bit the story of, of using clustering uh, in thing. And clustering falls in a generic category of uh, exception. This is uh, the last slide of, of, of Sutta Pachi used that in the defense. And she actually tries to explain the nature of the clusters, the frequency of the population. Notice bigger clusters than smaller clusters. Okay, and then it, she tries to look at what the characteristics are, size of the populations, etc. Et it looks a little bit difficult to you, correct? You get used to this. You, get used to it. you know, this, there is a big discussion in education or on auditing and etc. of how much statistics, how much uh, computer science, etc. you guys need. And the reality is that in the future you need much more statistics. You need much more understanding of analytic methods because you'll be one level more detached from the data than the old auditors, sometimes two levels more detached. Okay, so you'll need it. But the question is like, do you need the level of explanation that Paul gave on clustering to understand what the problems are? Probably not. This is an opening dis is an open discussion. He's a PhD student, he better know that. But that doesn't mean that you need to know. We need to kind of be able to graduate. And you know, maybe I just give you Waker, I give you a data set, and explain you what the outputs mean. And you are not going to try 23 methods and, and different approaches to, to value exceptions. You give you something more simple. Maybe that's good enough. Yes, thank you. I didn't say that those duplicate payments were fraudulent. I just say that you find duplicate payments. Uh, we use the technology called fuzzy sets. And uh, fuzzy sets basically looks at things that are not exactly the same, what are similar. When we got this data set from Dr. Gabel, uh, it had about uh, 845 gigabytes of information. Big data, correct? And uh, it had been vetted by ENY. And we found something like 148 duplicate companies in there. And uh, the, the more classic example of how this goes through is one is called, one company is called IBM. And the other company is called IBM Control H. So looks to the I, same company. But prints or shows in the screen different. Uh, uh, prints are shown the screen the same way, but the actually character set is different. So this, if there are payment for these two, looks like a different company. Looks like a different thing. And people that enter date progressively learn little tricks because it's a pain to keep repeating things and etc. So they learn little tricks to have the system accept the payment. And but, uh, Michael, don't go crazy about fraud. I, I always say, uh, Albrecht and Albstrich, about 100 transactions that are anomalous, maybe five are fraud. Okay? Go crazy about anomalous. Because, and the other thing Paul said here, and that's one I really disagreed with Paul, is if data is not good, all data you're ever going to get is bad. Okay, there is no such a thing as systems with great data. Okay, because you, uh, you override a lot of parameters just to be able to operate. And then the other thing is you change the meaning of field. And then you do what, what they did. They aggregate different systems that generate the data. You have to be, he is not very patient. I don't think I would like to be married with him. Just imagine, just imagine what his wife would go to. Okay, he is so perfectionist. Correct? 
he's not married, so I can't speak on him. Uh, but uh, data, you always, I never seen a data set. Actually, we had one data set that was extremely good from Itaú. We called it the PPP CV Pandit dissertation. It was a predictive audit. And the results of prediction were pretty mediocre. And I finally realized what happened. What happened is that someone over there had cleaned up the data and took all the outliers out and adjusted the data and et cetera. So if we are building a normally model, you have to have the aberration. So finish up that we couldn't predict very well because it had been very nicely cleaned. He thought he was doing a great job. He did a great job to cleaning, but not, not for research, yes. Yeah, actually what she's saying is, is very, very much like this. These guys fed supposedly the same data set. The, the same format of data set. But actually, they were collecting data, some manually, some automatically, and they came in different. Now, you have this number, 100.12. OK? Sounds like a normal number. We'll get this guy here. What happens? There's two numbers, not one. Or put an I here, I0012 becomes becomes a character string. And this happens everywhere. That's why I say, uh, say clean data doesn't come very easy. And when you clean the dirty data, you have to be very careful. Because you have to be very, very careful because you buy, might be hiding the data or changing the nature of the data. Uh, okay, so this was the clustering story. Let's go to where we wanted to do computer. Paul, I don't need to hold you. You're welcome to stay, but you don't have to. Let me close this. Uh, we talked last time, if you recall, um, about what I call digital accounting symbolism. And I want to read you these things that I, this is actually was a modification of CPA Australia presentation. And you heard this one, correct? Why does it say, why do they say that? Yes, Ping went and spent, uh, you know, a week entering data for P card, and then the auditor finds a couple of digitation errors, give her help. Correct. And also, actually, what you should pick up on this is that auditing is retrospective, looks back. Okay. Now, a couple of other ones are added here. Steve Jobs saying, we need products like toothpaste. User needs to use it, use is as twice a day. Why does he say that? What did Steve Jobs say? Why do you need a product that you have to use it twice a day? You need it. You create, you create real need. Products that you use once a year, uh, are not the same kind of thing as a product that you use all the time. Okay, is audit like toothpaste? You need audit all the time, but as a you as an accountant in the job, last thing you want is the audit. Correct? Audit. You think about the auditors when they show on your face. That's it. Unless there is some big event going on. And stay with this because I, I want you to think about how do we make auditing like toothpaste. Other things Steve Jobs had. I really like some things that Steve Jobs would say. He was a pretty obnoxious guy, but he, 
he was a genius. What is this? Sounds like Paul explaining clustering, correct? There are, uh, is that three clicks clustering? Okay, what is he, this is saying? He wants things that are simple to use. Okay, anything that's complex to use has its own problem. And I think actually that's the problem with, with the way Paul went about clustering. Paul is a real expert. And what happens is that by emphasizing the details, you lost, you lost what you really want to do with it. Okay, so that was dumpling, but I'll pass the thing ahead. Uh, just think about this. This is actually kind of a representation of progressive automation. Things happen. You use automatic sensing these days to capture the things. If you have to enter them manually, what you are doing is creating a large number of errors. Then you store it away and you actually might have more than one storage places and reason. You might put it public on a cloud. Now, what are the problems that they, you all know about the cloud, correct? Right? You at least have an idea what the cloud is, and I'm going to give you immediately. Why do people put things on the cloud? What's the reason for putting things on the cloud? Yeah, it's accessibility and also mass storage, correct? Is the two things that, that you talk. Now, by creating the cloud and using the cloud, are you creating any problems? You are creating exposures, okay? Now, are, is your computer more safe sitting in your facilities, like at Rutgers, or is it safer in the cloud? Yeah, I think that's a fair response. But if you put your computer, close the doors here, put two machine gun yielding guards and no, and no remote access, you're more secure than if you let people access it remotely, correct? Now, if you put, let people access it remotely, put encryption on the lines, put double passwording and have some monitoring procedures, you are better off than if you just give remote access. But remember what I said, and say, keep saying, computing technology give it, technology take it. Now, in order to use your computer in the cloud, very convenient, very useful, and you know there's another advantage, the guys managing this are real computer professionals. They are doing this for hundreds of other companies. If something goes wrong here, they are out of business. A little bit better than your three guys on your computer, correct? My wife is a CFO. If you, any one of you go to my wife and say what I say about her in class, okay, I'm going to go and change your grade to an F, okay? Uh, but my, my wife asked me, those computer guys, uh, does IT, IT does this, IT does, are they supposed to test your model? I have no idea what she's asking. Test your model. Okay, and say, what are you talking about? Say, well, we had a new impl implementation, and they keep saying it's user error, they don't understand it. And so, so we are, have been paying for this thing, and no one uses it. And so, are they supposed to test it? I said, oh, teach your, your staff to use it? After five minutes, she said, yes. I said, yes, they're supposed to teach us how to use it. They have responsibility. But if they don't know how to use it, oh, then they're not doing their job. Uh, but you see, this is the kind of level of internal technical support that you get. Meaning, I have been at Bell Labs, and the IT guys over there are extremely solicitous and very good. Sometimes I'm lazy, I just call them up instead of checking it out myself in my 25 years at Bell Labs, okay? Uh, but in other places, you know, I don't go to technical staff here very much. 
Now, there are a couple of guys that know what they're doing, but most don't. So it's more trouble. I have to go and ask Paul or ask Spain. You had a question. There has been security issues in cloud, but will they tell you? Why not, Michael? Absolutely. It's like the banks. If, if people manage to go and steal money from a bank easily, will you put your money there? Of course not. Even if you know that the government is guaranteeing and etc. So banks keep pretty quiet about defraudation and etc. Et and same thing. Very good. That's the same thing. Okay, and then you bring these things together, and then you do all kind of automated delivery and you execute. And what's happening is all of this is becoming totally automated. And so there'll be a big layer between the company, their data, the integrated ERP, one after the other. And the other thing that is a big fallacy people don't understand is that you think that systems have controls and everything is controlled. It's not true. Many, many systems, most systems will have user overridable controls. So you can override the control. If it's well done, you need an approval level, etc. If it's fully done, you override his and override yours, it becomes a big mess. And you say, well, but these are credit systems. Not really. You need to be able to override parameters to operate on day-to-day -day business. John, I am a branch manager of Itaú Niban, a branch, one of the 4,500 branches. Jonathan is my client. Jonathan has a line of credit of $10,000. Jonathan issues a check and it exceeds it by $2,000. It comes to my desk. Okay, it's not automatically rejected. Why is it not automatically rejected? Because Jonathan might be the CEO of a company that we do business. We don't want to get him pretty upset. Correct? Second thing, Jonathan might have just deposited a check from the Brazilian government that was good. And so it just was a float thing. And I would approve that. So I need to override that limit. Jonathan might have a second savings account with $10 billion. Okay, or 10 billion reais. You don't know. So these are the operational things that happen day to day in banks and companies and etc. So you, although you have a set of controls, there are user definable controls. So don't let yourself be misled. 